We are one week away from Christmas 2021. That's Rich Campbell, the spreader of joy. I guess it's this way. Rich Campbell, the spreader of joy. I'm Dan Wiederer, here to take in some of that joy. Uh, we super are spreader. I'm a yeah. super spreader. This is going to be a super spreader event right here. <laughs> not a funny joke. Not timely right now. A lot of going on in the world with COVID-19. We'll get into a little bit of that in a little bit. Uh, but you're spreading joy. I'm happy to see that in this Christmas week. We're in week 15 of the NFL season. A lot of moving parts. A lot of things are fluid with what's going on in the league right now. COVID-19 surges happening all across the league, causing schedule changes, causing schedule changes, causing schedule changes. There's been three games moved. Uh, the Bears are still scheduled to play Monday night in their normal time slot. We'll see if that has to be adjusted at some point. But we're going to take a, a big picture lens to the Bears' plight right now. It's been uh, two years now, Rich, about since you jumped off the beat. And what has happened since your exit has been the Bears going 12 and 18 in the 30 games that they've played since you exited. Uh, you know where the frustration is. Let's just go with fully with the metaphor there. I was on the lifeboat. Everybody <laughs> else is going down with the ship. Yeah. And so, so obviously, you know where the frustration level was mm -hmm. in 2019, where they thought that Super Bowl window was opening. They went eight and eight. Mr. Trubisky did not show the uh, developmental breakthrough that everyone was expecting. Well, it's been two more years of wheels stuck in the mud spinning. And now all of a sudden, the organization seems to be on the brink of major significant changes. The question is, what are they and who do they impact? Just curious from afar and, and still sort of from up close, at least with a unique vantage point on what you know about this organization and where it's headed, what you make of the current state and where we take this entire conversation as we try to, uh, to figure out what, what the remedies and the prescriptions are for an organization that's clearly sick. Mm -hmm. well, well, to talk about my joy, nothing brings me more joy than to read a, a takeout written by you. Uh, always great work. And I've had it, the, the pleasure of being behind the scenes on so many of those over the years and to see what you wrote in, in Wednesday's uh, chicagotribune.com and, and Sunday's newspaper was such a fantastic, comprehensive, fair look at the organization's processes, the, the competence of the people they have in charge and, and the quality of their processes. So as the, the, the team heads towards another review and, and possibly ready to, to detonate it, right? And start over once again, looking as high up the ladder as possible is, is where you obviously took that, that deep dive of yours and, and where we need to, to start looking. Um, I, I appreciated that you, you know, for maybe for the sake of space, maybe for the sake of, of just accuracy, you sort of assume Matt Nagy's fate is sealed, right? It, th this goes higher than that. Ryan Pace, as the general manager, some real doubts about whether he will stay or leave, but not necessarily an open and shut verdict here. And then even higher than that with the revelation that Ted Phillips is openly contemplating removing himself formally from any type of oversight, any type of um, accountability or at least hierarchical oversight of the football operations. It's a big deal. So, 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 so let me, let me take you through this, right? Because well, let's present a hypothetical. Okay. You know, you've got the McCaskey family as the owners. They are the founding family of, of the NFL. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's quite a compliment. It's quite a title, but it's, and it's also true. The McCaskey, you know, the house McCaskey family, they're the founders of the NFL, right? So they, they're, they're frustrated, right? With the state of the organization, the things the, the losses are piling up. They, they are stuck in mediocrity. And so, you know what they do? Let's, let's, let's present this, right? They, they go out and, you know, they are smart enough to admit that they can't figure it out themselves. You know, look, they're the founding family of football. They still need help. So what do they do? They they seek the the counsel of a you know multi Super Bowl winning executive, right? And and they ask him, hey, help us with this. Who do we need to hire as a GM? How do we need to structure our organization? And this guy helps you, right? Um, and, and you go out and you hire a, a up and coming GM, right? Who's got a Super Bowl ring? Who's got an extensive history in in pro scouting, right? Knows the league. Like I said, has a Super Bowl ring. You hire a, a coach that's been to the Super Bowl before it. You, you understand where I'm going here. This is exactly what they did in 2015. Right. You know, they, they sought the counsel of Ernie Accorsi. They hired a former Super Bowl winning executive in Ryan Pace who hired a coach in John Fox who had been to the Super Bowl before that hasn't worked. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were smart enough then to know we need help. 
Yeah. Ernie, you know, is Ernie, of course, he going to be able to help us out? And here they are again. So what do you do? And, and it's not a, it's, it can't be a rhetorical question. Obviously they're going to have to answer it, but I, what I really appreciate one of the many things about the story you wrote Wednesday was that there were still flaws, even though they did some process um, that, that they added to the process in ways that made sense, right? It's consulting with respected people in the league. They still never really set up Ryan Pace with a support structure to grow in the job. Maybe that's the new layer. Maybe that's what changes this time. I, I've said a lot. Uh, interested in your thoughts there, but but there are some uh, there are some improvements they can make even to a process that back in 2015 I thought was fairly sound. Yeah, well, there's some layers to this, and you mentioned a couple of them that are worth sort of forking off on the road, and yeah, you know how we like to fork off on the road at times and do some things. But the first thing being that when 2015 occurred, you and I both heard from people around the league when the Bears brought in Ernie Corsi to help them oversee their general manager and coach search simultaneously, was that this was an open admission by the folks at 1920 Football Drive in Lake Forest that they didn't have enough football knowledge to do this on their own, right? That they didn't have people in place at the top of the power structure that felt confident enough in their football knowledge to do this on their own. Fine. They deserve some form of credit for making that open admission. But then Ernie Corsi brings people in and who is there to supervise them, right? That's it's it. Bill, George, and Ted. And so what we've experienced with seven years of Ryan Pace as the general manager is Ryan Pace basically be, being given full autonomy, right? And George McCaskey saying repeatedly with great pride that his general manager is, is basically left to run the football side of things without anyone interfering, without anyone disrupting the process. And one of the things that we mentioned in the story and that folks you know, connected to the team around the league elsewhere said was, there's a difference between meddling in the general manager's business and providing productive oversight, right? And I think that's what's been lacking for Ryan's seven years here is you haven't had a team president with a football background that can tell your general manager where his blind spots are, that can challenge your general manager in ways that he's not used to being challenged, that can push your general manager outside his comfort zone, whether that be in talent evaluation, whether that be in the way you handle the media and prevent, present a leadership persona to the outside world, which includes, you know, fans, media, and the general public. Yep. There's a lot that goes with oversight, right? And you and I work together side by side for seven years and, and openly will admit to our audience here that there was something very productive about having that other person in the chair beside you to challenge you and push you and question you and say, what if we try this instead? Or what if mm -hmm. we do that? Ryan Pace seems like he's been left on his own for seven years, had some great successes. Again, it's worth pointing out, he was the executive of the year named by the Sporting News coming out of the 2018 season mm -hmm. after they traded for Khalil Mack, made the playoffs and won a division championship, you know, hired Matt Nagy, who at the time was the NFL's coach of the year. In retrospect, that seems like it was a hollow honor. But there were a lot of things that he was able to accomplish. He wasn't able to accomplish as much as the organization thought he would be able to, perhaps in part because he hasn't had direction, right, from above, hasn't had the people to evaluate him on a regular basis, annually, semi-annually, whatever it is, to tell him, listen, Ryan, we like this, didn't love this. What if you try this? What if in, in, in 2017, when you're searching for a quarterback, you decide to talk to all three of the top prospects in person before you make up your mind and trade away all this draft capital and not tell the head coach what you're doing? A lot there, Rich, but I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in saying, look, that there's an oversight issue here that needs to be addressed in this next cycle. Absolutely. And, and just go ahead and look at Ryan's track record, you know, his, his resume when he was hired with, for the, uh, at, you know, House Hall in, in 37 years old, 37 years old, had worked in the NFL since 2000, all of it with one organization, right? And, and in that organization, you had Sean Payton as the talent evaluator, you know, the final say on talent. Then Mickey Loomis as the GM, who Ryan considered a mentor of his, um, mostly on, you know, on the business side, right? Cap side. Ryan did not have a lot of worldly experience, so to speak. You know, like I said, one organization. He brings with him his two tightest pals from the Saints, and Joey Lane, who oversees the salary cap for the Bears, deals with uh, signings, you know, deals with agents and signing of free agents and, and trades and all that. And Josh Lucas is his number one scout. Where's the outside voice? Okay, well, he hired Champ Kelly from the Broncos. Champ's still in the organization. He hired Joe Douglas. Joe Douglas left after one year, I believe. Um, went to the Eagles, and now he's a general manager. So. Uh, with the Jets, I believe. And yep. I'm right about that. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, Ryan, you see the plan there. 
You see what he tried to establish with trusted confidants, along with some outside voices that he respected. And a veteran head coach at the time, right? Like a veteran head coach would right? help and, him along. John was supposed to. That's right. But ended up getting frayed there because they weren't going to see eye to eye on the quarterback. And so that never, you know, as it changed, it never improved. You know, there was no more oversight, right? They didn't go through the 2017 quarterback debacle and make a change, right? right. To say like, okay, well, maybe Ryan needs help. You know, maybe he needs that other voice. Uh, and, and so that, to me, is what the Bears have to layer into whatever they decide to do going forward. Now, as, as your reporting um, continues here, it'll be interesting to see what they, they choose with Ryan. And, and from what it sounds like, from what you've told me and, and written and uh, what we know about Ryan and the organization is that it's not necessarily a, a case closed here, which I think is, is fascinating because if you just look at the wins and losses yeah. in the draft – and the state of the roster and the state of the salary cap, it, it's, it, it goes one way, right? That's a stacked case against Ryan Pace being the GM of the team uh, or any part of the football operation in 2022. Seven seasons, zero playoff victories, a win percentage below 0. 0.420. That's not great. Uh, as you mentioned, you go through the, the the draft classes. It's hard to pick out one of those where you say unqualified success. Absolutely you put a, a red check mark and say that was a, a, a great draft. Uh, free agency one, hits. one winning record right free agency hits free agency misses as you mentioned the, the the perception around the league right now is that while there is a collection of young promising talent in certain pockets of the depth chart the depth chart at large needs to be rebuilt i mean yeah, that's I mean, a big word what rebuilt. you're basically saying is the cupboard's not bare i'd give you that right david montgomery maybe um roquan you know, smith roquan, yeah roquan smith, Jalen johnson, johnson Donnell mooney you know mooney, we've got some but, pieces yeah, but but, but you but don't have you're not saying that's a I'm not saying that's a core right to build around. I, I would say more of the cupboard's not bare. Okay, right, right. So so that's there, right? And so so then you say, okay, so what would it be that this organization sees that allows them to think that keeping Ryan in some capacity is in their best interest? Okay, well, you and I have experienced this, right? Ryan has an ability to articulate a vision in a way that instills confidence. He doesn't do it enough to the public, as you and I have talked about forever, that, that when Ryan speaks, it generally gives the outside world a sense of, oh, at least we understand where he's going with this. And at least we mm -hmm. understand the sound philosophies behind it. And when you can do that with your bosses, they say, okay, you know, sounds good. Particularly bosses that may not necessarily know what questions to ask to challenge some of your philosophies and say, well, wait a minute, that's gotten us, you know, the results that we just mentioned. Uh, Ryan has also been given the freedom to Take another swing at the quarterback position, right? And that happened last April when they drafted Justin Fields. And they mm -hmm. traded up from the 20s, walked out of the draft with Justin Fields, and said, okay, we may have a future star that can suddenly make all of these other areas that are of major concern seem of lower concern because the quarterback position is stable. The great if eraser. You're, if yeah. you're Ryan, you say, listen, you gave me the, the chance to make a swing at that. I did. I got you a guy that has a chance to be a, a, a potential standout. Give me an opportunity to see that through, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that, that, that may complicate this for George and or Ted. If you're going to keep Ryan around, the question that I have is, are you keeping him around in the same role with a president of football operations that's new overseeing him? If so, you're going to have a difficult time convincing other president candidates to come in and say, here, here's the GM we have for you. Because then yeah. Ryan's going to be on the hot seat and you're playing that game. If you move Ryan to a president of football operations position and essentially promote him and allow him to hire the next GM, what general manager candidates are signing up for that structure, right? And then, so now to figure out what does this look like and how does it seem? But to your point, it doesn't seem like it's a foregone conclusion that Ryan's out the door, whereas it does seem like an absolute fait accompli that Matt Nagy's days are numbered and will end here within the month. Yeah, it's a, it's a testament to Ryan's personality that, George and Ted, they, they like him so much. And you know, after covering him for seven seasons, I like him too. He, he, it's great to talk football with Ryan. He, he, When you talk football with Ryan, you come away feeling smarter about football, smarter about players, smarter about scouting, smarter about the way the league works. It's very easy to see, for, from my standpoint, why George would be enamored of him. It's not easy for the public to see that because the Bears do a terrible job of showcasing those positive qualities of Ryan. And some of it's Ryan's reluctance himself. But overall, he needs to be more uh, uh, front-facing. He needs to be more 
he needs to have a higher profile. And he was never comfortable with that. Uh, that's just his demeanor. And ultimately, it's it, it's quite possible in a month, we say it's part of his downfall, that the, yeah. that the fan base never really understood what the team saw in him. I will say this, too. You look around uh, the, the NFL and general managers, right? It's 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 not like coaching, where coaches get recycled. They get, they get other chances. And Ryan has said this. He knows you get one shot, yep. right, to be a GM. OK, think about all the GMs in league history, right? If you had a bell curve, had a bell curve of, of the quality of the opportunity they have, right? How many GMs out there got to pick in the top 10 of the draft, their first four drafts? How many of them got to rebuild the team headquarters and football <laughs> facilities? Yeah. Right. How many of them got to hire two coaches? How many of them got to pick two first round quarterbacks? Ryan Pace's the quality of the opportunity he has had. And sign the, sign or trade for three other veteran quarterbacks, right? Right. right. And also traded for a uh, uh, former defensive player of the year in Khalil Mack. The quality of the opportunity Ryan Pace was given here is 99.9 .9 percentile. Yeah. Right? You cannot say he wasn't given a fair shake or they needed to see it through. If we get to the end of this month and and They've put together kind of what you said here is like, look, we want to make these changes to this structure. We want a president of football operations with a GM underneath them reporting to the president. And they figure out who has final say and draft picks and, and the 53-man the roster and all that, whatever. Fine. I don't know how Ryan is part of that, like you said, as an incumbent and finding people to come in and work with that. You can't say he didn't have the chance, man. He had every chance uh, an executive could dream of. And the results on the field speak for themselves as far as I see it. So I don't want to rehash the entirety of the 2017 quarterback draft process, which has been well-documented and most well-documented by you and I in 2019 when we took a deep dive into that whole process and sort of illuminated some of the flaws mm -hmm. within that process. But I bring it up again for two reasons where we're at in this conversation. The first reason being that the Bears are still trying to dig out of that hole that came with missing on the, the, the trade up to draft Mitch Trubisky. Mitch Trubisky didn't even get the fifth year in his rookie contract, right? Mitch Trubisky is on to a backup role in Buffalo and the Bears are reinventing themselves at quarterback once again, because that pick didn't work out. And not only was it a top three pick, it was a top two pick that cost a lot of other draft capital. And again, had flawed processes. If you need to re-examine the flawed processes, find our story online, just go to Google, type in, why did the Bears draft Mitch Trubisky? Have fun with your afternoon. But the second reason I bring that up, Rich, is because Coming out of the 2019 season, the, the well-documented, disappointing season that we've talked about before, George and Ted met- Ran with, me out of the business. <laughs> they met with reporters in the midway after the, the year-end press conference and, and were addressing a wide array of topics. And both of them separately addressed which part of the quarterback evaluation, and, and in this case, the misevaluation of Trubisky, how big of a part of their evaluation was that of Ryan. And both kind of moved past it very quickly. Well, there's more than the quarterback position, George said. Ted said something that a couple of sources reminded me of, and I went back and checked the transcripts and everything else, where he said, well, nobody knew Patrick Mahomes was going to be this good. And, and, and so, you know, what are you going to do? And one source said to me, it's like Ted just took a shrug and said, ah, just luck of the draw, right? Like you're just playing a, a, a game of blackjack and the cards you got were wrong. Well, wait a minute. One team thought that Patrick Mahomes was going to become a star. It's the Kansas City Chiefs who are now – on a seven game winning streak and positioned once again to make a deep run in the playoffs after winning a Super Bowl, going to another one, having the young quarterback win in most valuable player award. And so this, this kind of luck of the draw shrug past failure that has existed in this organization is worth highlighting because that's a high profile example with probably the most significant, if not the most significant, certainly in the top three of decisions that Ryan Pace has made during his seven years as general manager and he missed badly on it. And his boss, who is in charge of evaluating him, just says, huh, who knew, you know, and, and moved on to the next season without really having that level of standard and accountability that everyone in the outside world is currently demanding and shouting in a megaphone saying, raise your standards and learn how to evaluate. And so that's why I bring that up again, because that just stuck with me, right? Like you're coming out of a year that everyone thought was going to end in the Super Bowl. Instead, it was eight and eight. Your quarterback was on a downward descent. The other guy's quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes, were on an upward ascent, and your, your your brain trust at the top of the organization just said, oh, well. 
yeah, you you wrote this in the the piece earlier this week uh, about over the years, members of the organization who have arrived and and have joined an organization that is steeped in tradition that has a lot of people in roles that have been there for a long time, especially higher up in the organization. They use the word complacency. They notice a complacent operation. Multiple people have said that to me over the years, to you over the years. That, if I were a fan of the team, that would be the most infuriating. Because, of course, the, the, the pro product on the field leaves no room for complacency. Right. They're, they're the definition of irrelevant. Uh, nationally, they, they, they have no sustained success. And you think, how could you be complacent? Well, you ended up explaining that at the end of your piece because people from the outside still see an organization steeped in tradition. You just see the colors, right? You see the navy and the orange and the sea, and you just sort of feel that. You know, there's so many Bears fans everywhere. They travel great. They're one of the charter franchises of the league, and it's still widely regarded as a, as a fantastic job, fantastic opportunity. You, you've heard this all the time, all oh, the fan base here and you know, the defensive tradition and all that. How how does the complacency warrant it here? It, it it really requires such a thorough breakdown of that this coming off season, an outward recognition. I believe Gary Gary Fensick said that that they want the outward recognition that they're they're going about it the wrong way, that they're lost, that they've made mistakes, that they need patience from the fan base. You know, just some type of acknowledgement that look, we're getting it wrong. We've got to continue to figure out how to get it right, but we don't have the answers and we don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. We yeah, I mean, look, you look over my right shoulder here, there's a picture of Walt Payton, right? Arguably the greatest football player of all time. It's inside a book that takes you through a decade by decade history of the Chicago Bears. You thumb through that and people will go through that and go, whoa, look at all these Hall of Famers. Look at all this glory. Look at all this tradition. And it feels great. People on the outside world see this as a destination job because it's in a world-class city with a world-class fan base with a sleeping giant mentality that if you could awaken this thing, imagine if the Bears could go to the playoffs for four consecutive years, right? Four consecutive years would be blowing anything that they've done for the last 30 years out of the water. This city would be alive like it's never been alive before, right? Yeah. And so people in the outside world that want to take a swing at this job understand the potential that's here, right? And, and Ryan did too. Ryan said the same thing when he when he was hired. And you make a good point because it, it, it is such a, a, a attractive quality, but it also can lead to that complacency. Yeah. And that's an issue. For those who are looking for the story that I wrote this week, the first three words in the headline are disorder, disappointment, dysfunction. Three pretty heavy D words, right? And if the Bears are going to be honest with themselves about eliminating their decades worth of struggles, they have to understand that those three words are very, very heavy. And they demand that you go department by department, employee by employee across your entire organization and figure out, is there a way we can raise the bar and help our product on the field be more successful on a regular basis? You just cannot sort of accept mediocrity as, as willingly as they've seemed will, you know, to accept mediocrity over the years and expect people in the outside world to understand at this point. They, 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 people are at wit's end, you know, you, it's not just fans that are that are venting. You hear this now from former players with passion. You hear it from people that really have no dog in the fight in Chicago who look with almost a sense of pity on the Chicago Bears for how long they've been failing. And that's sad, right? That should be sad to you if you're George McCaskey and to your original point, the entire family that descends from the Hallis lineage and saying, boy, this is really how everyone else in the outside world looks at us. We'd better be willing to take a look in the mirror and, and, and be honest with what we see. The word sad, I think, is a perfect description. And and I tweeted out the night that the Bears drafted Justin Fields is that I just hope you know, that, that the torture ends for, for the fans. I mean, it, it is truly excruciating to, to see them lay themselves out right and and just expose all those raw nerves and and have it repaid so brutally over and over again and um the, you know to, to wrap it up here by talking about fields a little bit i mean I, I think inside the building they would like to think that they've got their guy yeah they would have said the same thing about mitch after the first season right i mean justin oh. fields performance has been uh intoxicating at times the, the flashes of athletic brilliance are undeniable and yet the struggles are too yeah. there is no way an objective 
uh, analysis of his play this season could lead you to conclude that he is without a doubt going to to be the savior of the franchise. There's no way he's not good enough yet. Yeah, yeah, right. And he 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 is afforded more time. Like you know, yes, we of owe it to him to give him more time. And the verdict on that conversation is certainly a ways off. But you're right. He's got 14 turnovers. He's got a passer rating below 70. The Bears continue to have the league's worst passing attack yes. by a wide margin. He's lost seven of the first nine games he started as an NFL quarterback. None of these things tell you, okay, rubber stamp it, absolutely mm-hmm. going to be your quarterback in 2027. Now just mm-hmm. de- devote your attention to all the other needs on the roster. No, you're not there yet. And so the Bears have to figure out a way to, to get Justin help. Right, like well, that's got to be the 2022 yeah. priority. Get Justin help, and that means stabilizing the offensive line, particularly at the tackle positions. Adding more weapons on offense, pairing him with a coach who sees the game the exact same way he does, and that takes an innate feel, you know, from whoever's making that decision to get a structure in place where then it doesn't become what we lived through with Matt Nagy and Mitch Trubisky, where it was like, oh boy, it seems like there's a tug of war going on here instead of a pulling in the same direction thing. And we saw what that ended up with. And so there's a lot at stake, particularly when you have at least identified a guy who has standout potential, probably star potential, given what we've seen from him. But to this point, you can't objectively look at all the things we looked at. The eye test tells you he's better than Mitch Trubisky. The yes. numbers do not, because Mitch Trubisky's rookie year was not as roller coastery as this one has been. Well, I think maybe the best thing you could say about uh, Justin Fields at this point is that his presence – his off-field football character and and his athleticism on the field will make the Bears' openings more attractive than others in the league that don't have the quarterback to build around. I'm not not saying the proven quarterback, but a quarterback you're at least going to be excited about and you can very clearly develop a plan around. And if you go back to the draft, I mean, it's well-documented at this point that many teams in the league – did not regard Justin Fields as low as the fourth or fifth best quarterback in the draft class, you know, behind Zach Wilson, behind Trey Lance. There are teams that had him ranked behind Trevor Lawrence, right, and just number two guy. It just kind of tells you a consensus in the league is there's going to be optimism and it's going to make the job more attractive. Um, Matt has had his chance, and and it hasn't gotten anywhere. Now, you made another great point in, in the article Matt's tugged a couple different ways. It's difficult to get a guy to, to just jump in and be that guy in year one. You know, Patrick Mahomes wasn't that guy. Matt Nagy knows that. He went out inside Andy Dalton. But if you have a win or else yeah. uh, a directive, it, it causes conflicting in, incentives here. And we talked yeah. about this on our early in the season on our, in the show here. So um, it's sad. It's sad because uh, a couple of good guys, at least one, and maybe another one, they'll be uh, – they, they will – leave Hallis Hall, their time marked with failure, right? They didn't get the job done that they were hired to do, and and they'll reset. It'll be fascinating to see um, what it looks like by February 1st. I think if they, if they blew out the current staff, coach and football ops, and they decided to go with team president, you know, Ted's Ted's on the stadium, right? He's, he's out of, he's, he, there is nothing about um, a football like a decision to hire or fire a GM that goes to Ted. Like he's right. completely out of that. You would need right. that either goes to George or more likely a team president of some kind, a, a president of football operations. If you did president of football ops, GM, coach, and then you figured out that that power structure somehow, then I think you would go, okay, they're trying something new. They're, tr- they're learning from what has gone wrong. And now you just got to let it see it play out. To me, that would make the most sense. Well, and the point I make to a lot of people with what you just mentioned, team president, general manager, head coach, those are three pretty big positions. And they all have many, many branches Mm -hmm. of people below them, right? On each staff. If you start with a head coach, you got to hire coordinators. Then you got to hire position coaches on both sides of the ball. General managers got to go through the scouting department, figure out what he wants to do there. Pro personnel, college scouting, all those things. There are, I mean, you're talking about, dozens and dozens and dozens of prospective new employees, right? By the time we get to, to, to late March. And so that is a big, big, heavy lift, but it seems at this point that it's necessary given what we've seen. There are still four seasons, hard to imagine. This is a perfect way to segue 
into our picks for the week because the Bears Monday night game, as of now, I, I should mention that we are recording on Saturday afternoon and things are very fluid in the league. So that some of this may be outdated by the evening. Mm-hmm. But the Bears are scheduled to play the Vikings Monday night at Soldier Field. They are uh, currently six and a half point underdogs. That line has moved significantly after the COVID surge hit Hallis Hall this week. As we are recording this, 13 Bears players are on the reserve COVID-19 list. That's a list that includes Allen Robinson, Eddie Goldman, Eddie Jackson. And so there's a lot of moving parts to what the Bears are doing. They haven't really been able to practice this week. It's been glorified walkthroughs at Hallis Hall this week. And so here we are. Chance to uh, to pick this game. I'm giving you the first crack at, at, at telling us what you see. I'm going to pick the Bears. Uh, I, I just think that six and a half points, even with a, a crazy week and depleted roster for you know divisional game at Soldier Field Monday night, it's too much. It's too much. Um, they had to change quarterbacks. I, I would, might change my mind about that. And I, I think the Bears did, obviously, at least in the first half anyway, against Green Bay, some exciting things. Maybe they can build on um, p- perhaps something there. Uh, I don't expect them to lay down the sword. Uh, I expect them to play hard. They've continued to do so under Matt Nagy. It's a tough week for them, of course. But, yeah, six and a half is too much for me. I'll, I'll take the Bears, and, and I actually feel very good about it. I'm with you in that thinking. I actually am picking the Vikings to win, but the Bears to, to cover the six okay. and a half to stay in that three or four point range. The Vikings uh, won in Soldier Field a year ago, uh, but that was without fans. And the Vikings have historically had some significant problems getting out of Soldier Field with a victory. I'm picking them to win on Monday night, but I think it's going to be another close game. Remember, this is a Vikings team that gave the Lions their only win just a couple yeah. weeks ago. So they're not uh, necessarily a team that blows people out a lot. All right. Game of the week. It's a Saturday night game this week. It's Colts and Patriots. This is a Colts minus two line, and it is an intriguing football game if I've ever seen one on a Saturday in December. Yeah, big deal here uh, in the Indy area. The Colts, oddly enough, are coming off their bye. So are the Patriots, I believe. I mean, they both had week 14 buys, yeah. which is wild. Strange, um, yeah. the, the Colts are in a position at seven and six in a crowded AFC where they need to go three and one down the stretch to to – make the playoffs as a wild card. They're, they're not going to catch Tennessee in all likelihood because they blew a couple chances earlier this year. They've got the Patriots this week and the Cardinals next week before finishing with the Raiders and Jags. So they've got to take one of two games from either the Patriots or Cardinals. At some point, the Patriots are going to stumble. And, and I've said this on the show. And you know me on the two and a half, Dan, especially right. the home teams laying only two and a half. But the Colts with the exception of their big win against Buffalo in Buffalo this year, which is looking worse and worse as the bills continue to stumble, but the Colts have not been able to, to seize the moment in, in games that have defined their season, whether it was the Buccaneers game at home, the, the Ravens Monday night game on the road where they blew yeah. that lead uh, early in the season against Tennessee, both games, really, they lost to the Rams at home with turnovers. I just, I, I've, I've been a believer in the Colts all season. I think they have a good team. I think they are – They, I'd love to see them in the playoffs. I think they deserve to make the playoffs. They'll be better than some of the NFC teams that make it, whether they the Colts make it or not. I just I, – I doubt them. I doubt them against a team like the Patriots, and I think they're going to – I think they're going to lose tonight. Okay. Well, I'm taking the Colts, so – Okay. That's me sticking it back right at you. I, I yeah. don't know why. The Colts uh, – I mean, the Patriots have won seven straight – and covered seven straight. So they're on a roll here that that is very significant. And But to your yeah. point, just feels like there's a law of averages game. There's a law of averages, right? And, and maybe Jonathan Taylor gets them on the on the right foot. All right, we're going to move on to the lock. And uh, I'm going to gonna lock the Dallas Cowboys, who are playing a division game against the New York Giants. But the Giants are a mess right now injury-wise, and they really don't have enough firepower to keep up with a team like Dallas. So the 10 and a half seems like a huge number in a game like that. But then you go through the depth chart that the Giants are looking at right now and you say, yeah, the Cowboys can can get that to a, a 16, 17 point win without much difficulty. So that's where I am in my lock this week. Okay, cool. I am locking the under of Washington football team against the Eagles. It's under 42. Washington is going to have to start Garrett Gilbert at quarterback. <laughs> uh, who they signed Game got moved back. So, you know, yesterday well okay even if they even if they end up are you know they end up being able to start either taylor heineke or kyle allen no one's practiced this week yeah right so i mean they're, they're in disarray there washington has a ton of, of people on the COVID list 
I'll just take my chances with that under, given the, the quarterback problems there. I like your thinking. All right. Upset pick of the week. I, I was struggling here. Uh, you know, you're coming off a week in which a lot of road favorites won. And when a lot of road favorites win, you just sort of feel like chalk carries it the next week. I was, so I was, I'm, I'm trying, I'm struggling to get out of that mindset myself. Tempted to take the Seahawks at plus 210 against the Rams okay. team that has its own COVID issues. It, I think the last check, they were north of 25 guys that were on the reserve COVID 19 mm -hmm. list. And when you see that, you say, boy, value here with the Seahawks team that's playing a little better. Russell Wilson seems to be feeling mm -hmm. a little bit of life. But I ultimately went with the Ravens at plus 240. So did I. At I home. did too. Two, plus home. 240. I just checked before we started. It's plus 240 now. That, that's where I got. That's what I said. Okay. Plus 240. And, and, and they're playing a Packers team that uh, has to go on the road. And Lamar Jackson, despite having the ankle injury, looks like he is going to play. And that was obviously the deciding factor in the pick. It sounds like you're in complete agreement with all of that. The Ravens are the best value on the upset line this week. Yeah. And um, since you and I are sharing the same pick, I'll give you another one that I thought about. You're looking at some shorter dogs. Cincinnati plus three at Denver. Um, really bad loss for them against San Francisco at home last week. But since he just sort of regresses to the mean all the time, so I think a bounce back game for them. Um, and I thought Houston uh, plus 200 at Jacksonville. Uh, Houston beat the Jaguars earlier this season. Jaguars are five point favorites. Of course, they that, that organization is in uh, chaos this week with the firing of Urban Meyer. You probably find a lot of Jaguars fans who say that's going to be a better team without Urban there. Uh, but as, as you're looking for candidates, maybe reasons to play a money line dog, go for it. Hold that thought. Okay. Uh, <laughs> teaser. Okay. You know I love my teasers. I love this teaser as much as I've loved any teaser this year. Wow. The Falcons plus 15. Mm -hmm. Bumping that up to plus 15. Against the Buccaneers? Against, no, against the 49ers. 49ers, excuse and, me. And pairing that with Buccaneers Saints over 39 and a half. Tom Brady and his crew is going to get that offense going early and often. Uh, you, you get that game to, to get north of 40, that doesn't seem like too much of a challenge. I know the Saints are struggling a little bit, and they're going to have to keep up a little bit. But I love that one. That's mine for the week. I'm a teaser. All right. Um, I've actually done a uh, – I've, I've been doing a little bit better on the teasers um, as of late. You're on fire right now. This is it's, I, Last I'm three weeks, I've had, I've had some good weeks here. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm taking notes on all your picks. Um, I mentioned Cincy, you know, they're, they're three, they're getting three at the Broncos right now. So take that to nine. I think they keep that within nine points. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pair them with the bears. I'm, I'm bring the bears down to, uh, or bring the bears up to 12 and a half. And I think the bears keep that within 12 and a half. I think they cover anyway, but I think that's a, a safer play. Um, Doubling down on a Bears team that's got ma major COVID <laughs> problems. Let me know if uh, if you think that's crazy. I'm actually ten and three against the spread picking the Bears this year. So hopefully, uh, that's I'm pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty I'm good. That's a, a good pulse on it. All right, give me your just. For um, fun. I thought about Rams. I thought about Rams bringing that down to a, a half point, but you you talked me out of it just now. You're With right. That team has COVID issues, and the Seahawks could win that game. Yeah. Uh, give me your just for fun. I'm going with Texans Jags. Again, because why not, right? The two worst teams in the NFL. Let's have fun. Um, the total is 40. Okay. Boy, I mean, that's a low total in the NFL. So I'll go over. Probably, you know, usually if it's if it jumps out at being low, it probably means it deserves to be low. But I'll go over. I'm going to root for points in that game. All right. Well, I'm going to root for the Jaguars in that game because okay. I am I just for fun pick uh, taking the Jags minus five. And that is 41 a nothing. A lot of points for the Jags to be given. But, hey, listen, I got Sunday off because the Bears play on Monday night. If you really want to have fun, let's meet halfway between Indy and Chicago and watch Jags Texans somewhere at, like, a you know, Merrillville Buffalo Wild Wings or something like that. That sounds good. Yeah, Daryl Bevel, good. the interim coach filling in for uh, Urban Meyer, was the interim coach for the Lions after Matt Patricia got launched last year, came into Soldier Field and beat the Bears. So Daryl Bevel knows how to get a team rallied up after they fire their coach. <laughs> That's part of my logic there. It feels like you listen to Trevor Lawrence this week, and he seems like, man, you know, like the, some of the drama just left the building. Let's go. Let's go play football and, and just be normal. So the Jags are going to get a boost, and they're going to win that game. Yeah, and, and I actually was thinking along those lines that the, the departure of Urban Meyer is going to help them. But I also didn't want to bet on one team because they both stink. So I just thought, <laughs> hey, I'll bet they score. I'm just going to bet they score some points. There you go. All right. All right. That together to certain college, college special. Uh, Bowl I'm season. Thinking a Saturday night game in New Orleans, the New Orleans Bowl, Louisiana Lafayette, minus four against Marshall. 
don't have a lot to explain here. It's just Saturday night. There's a game in New Orleans and a bowl game. Louisiana Lafayette's been playing pretty well. Let's roll with it. All right, cool. I'm going with the Jimmy Kimmel LA Bowl. <laughs> Which I laughed at. I didn't even know that was a bowl before 30 minutes ago. Yeah, well, guess what? Utah State's going to cover the plus seven. I didn't uh, even know Utah State had a football program before. Like, no, and you know what? They put, a, they put a whipping on me when I went out to Vegas uh, a couple weeks ago, and I'm still smarting from that. If they don't come out looking – in this game, like they did in the Mountain West Championship, I'm going to be really upset. But yeah, um, Utah State plus seven. They're they're playing Oregon State. We still haven't done the what happens in Vegas. Rich Campbell review on the YouTube. Uh, we haven't even we haven't even done it away from the YouTube. I still haven't heard about your entire weekend in Vegas, and that's a big miss by me to not uh, to get more details of that. Although it did seem like via the text messages that that it was not necessarily profitable. It, 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 not on the football front. Deep side. Thank, Deep thank side. God for craps. And I know, okay. uh, I know, Big Al would uh, sky sky fist bump to Big Al on that. He uh, thank God for craps. Maybe Big Al was throwing the dice for me up there. That's, that's, I didn't think of that, but yeah, that's that's a good one. Uh, you, you know, like like anything with Vegas, the, the stories get better with time. Yeah. So if we, you know. Talk to you this week, and I'll, I'll fill you in. And at the Maribel Buffalo be Wild Wings. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, at the Maribel Buffalo Wild Wild Wings. Direct TV channel seven twelve has Jags Texans or whatever. Let's perfect. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, I'm in. So I'll see you there. Uh, that wraps it up. That's we covered a lot. I mean, that's a full slate of picks along with solving the Bears dysfunction. That's the, uh, a, a full day's work on a Saturday. Well, hopefully it's profitable for all of our uh, our viewers in more ways than one. Yeah. Before you go to the window come to the window and also stay here for all of the bears analysis that we just broke down in great detail. Thanks for spreading joy. Thanks for joining me again. We will, uh, we'll be back at it very soon.